That's longer than Ron's age and my age put together. We don't even imagine what it's like to be around for 250 years, longer than our country. This church, Stanford Baptist Church, has had a long and storied history. God has blessed evangelistic services, church plants, baptisms, Sunday schools, and today on our 250th anniversary as a church, we pause to honor and remember our past, to celebrate 250 years of God's faithfulness to this church and its ministry here in Stamford, Connecticut. But what is God's word to us today on this great day? Today, we turn to Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 for God's surprising word to us. As we just read, behold, do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? Notice the words, do not remember the former things. Do not consider the things of old. Isn't that what we're doing this weekend? Are we supposed to dishonor the past? No, we do have a great past. But it is not the past that we honor. We honor the God who has been faithful to us in the past. The question is not, do we have a great past? Undoubtedly, we do. Long and at times great and at times not so great. But the question today is, does Stanford Baptist Church have a great future? For some churches, the question today is, does our church even have a future? I want you to think for a moment about the first hearers of this word. Isaiah is speaking to the nation of Israel. Did they have a great past? Abraham? Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, Joseph, Moses, the exodus from Egypt, 40 years of God's faithfulness in the wilderness, the conquest of Jericho, and all of the promised land, all of the judges, the prophets like Elijah and Elisha. Israel had a past. And Isaiah dares say from the Lord, don't remember that. Don't focus on that. For them it was 1,300 years of miracles. And Isaiah is encouraging them to leave that behind. Yes, because God wants to do a new thing. Israel's best days were not behind her. As a matter of fact, the best was yet to come. God doesn't speak this way, but he could have been saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. I am just naive enough to believe that Stanford Baptist Church's best days are ahead of her. And this scripture not only applies to us as a congregation. This is God speaking. This applies to each one of us. God wants to do a new thing in you today. We want to go back to the past sometimes. We get nostalgic. We have a problem with former things. Some people have nostalgia for a glorious past. They're still living the days when they were lettering in high school and pulling out their trophies. Some of us have trouble with a shameful past that we can't get over, failures and rejections. God's word to all of us today is, on the brink of this new day, our next 250 years, and on the brink of this day the Lord has made for you, God says to me, to you, and to us collectively, behold, I will do a new thing, but will you not know it? First, we must deal with the past. 
What do we do with the past? Well, Isaiah 43, 18 says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Do we forget it? Most people cannot adequately deal with the present or the future because they have never adequately dealt with the past. So how do we deal with the past? What do we do? Well, the first thing we need to do is, counterintuitively, remember the past. You can't forget it until you remember it. You can't deal with it until you remember it. I know I just told us we should forget it, but we are not to be struck with amnesia. God says in Deuteronomy 5.15, Remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. This is in the midst of giving the Ten Commandments. God says, remember where you were. So he wants us to remember where we came from, not to forget our roots. He wants to re- us to remember where he brought us from. He wants us to remember what he did for us. He says it again in Deuteronomy 15, 15. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. He thought it important enough to repeat himself. When God says something once, take notice. If he says it twice, stop what you're doing. But he says it a third time, Deuteronomy 16, 12. And a fourth time, Deuteronomy 24, 18. And verse 22, a fifth time. Remember where you were when I found you, when I changed you. We can't enjoy where we are now if we can't look back and see how far God has brought us. So to see where we've been is not to focus on it. We need to deal with the past like we use a rearview mirror in our car. You have a rearview mirror in your car? If you spend your time driving looking in the rearview mirror, you're going to hit something in front of you. It's good to have a rearview mirror. Don't take it off. We need to refer to the past. We need to see what's gaining on us. But we need to be looking out the windshield. But the rearview mirror is helpful to remember where we've been. And so we refer to the past, but we don't stare at it as a church or as a person. So where have you been? Where did you come from? Where did God bring you from? When you remember it, only then can you take the second step to deal with the past, and that is to deal with the past. You can't deal with the past until you've remembered the past. It's very important to deal once and for all with your sins. All of us have sinned. And we need to deal with God about our sins. What do we do? Well, we can't undo them. We can't go back and change them. But we can find forgiveness for them in the cross. And so if you have never, ever dealt with God about your sins, Lord, I'm a sinner, and I know I can't save myself. Lord, would you save me? I can't be good enough to undo the bad things I've done. But you can receive God's gift of salvation if you have trusted him to handle your eternity, do you think that he can't save you? He saved Paul in 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, who says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Is that you? It's all of us. And he said, Of whom I am chief. Is he just being humble? No, he's not falsely humble here. He was a man who was persecuting and trying to kill Christians. Hopefully none of us have tried to do that. If he has come to save sinners, that's us. This is why he came, to deal with our past and to give us a future. When we have dealt with our sins once for all, we need to deal with them day by day. That's why in 1 John 1, 9 we read, Confess your sins to the Lord, and he's faithful and just not only to forgive us, but to cleanse us. We've had them all forgiven once and for all. But when we sin again, when we do something to break the Lord's heart, one by one we need to confess them to him. But you have to remember them to confess them. And so we deal with the past because Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 23, if you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way, be reconciled to your brother. Here's step number three. We've got to deal with our sins once for all with God. Then we need to deal with them one by one on a vertical level. But then we need to deal with them on a horizontal level. What about the people I've hurt today? And so I need to go and make things right. 
I need to be reconciled to my brother, but I can't deal with that past if I don't remember it. And so here's how we make things right. One thing we don't learn very well is how to say I'm sorry. Can I give you a quick lesson? It's not I'm sorry if. I'm sorry if I hurt you. I'm sorry if you're so sensitive. I'm, so, I'm sorry, but you were wrong too. That's not, a, that's not a biblical apology. A biblical apology has three parts. I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. Can you say that with me? I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. That wasn't so hard, was it? If you can use those words, you can heal some broken relationships. We have to remember what we've done, and we need to go to those people. Jesus says, leave the gift, take care of this first, then come back to the altar. He says, be reconciled. There are some, th- some people we need to forgive, some people we need to be forgiven by, but we need to let it go because when we carry the guilt, when we carry the bitterness, the anger, we're the one who ends up suffering, aren't we? And so our church needs to leave some bad situations in the past behind. You might have to ask someone with those three phrases, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. Make it an abject apology. Don't say, but you were wrong too. If they want to apologize, great, but you deal with your past. We need to remember it, deal with it, for Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. That's what we need. We don't want justice. We want mercy. How do you get mercy? You confess and forsake your sin. The third step is important. The past has value. That's why we remember it so we can deal with it, and we can then, third learn from the past. Proverbs 22, 3 says, a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Ancient piece of slapstick where Charlie Chaplin's walking down the street and you see him walking and then you see an open manhole cover and then you see him walking and getting close to the manhole cover and you're hoping that he doesn't fall in or maybe you're not so nice and you hope he does. But then, at the moment, he steps over the manhole cover. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to see those great big holes in front of us and avoid them. But sometimes we don't. We need to learn from the past so we don't repeat our mistakes. There's nothing wrong with making mistakes. There's something wrong with repeating them, right? We learn from our mistakes. Where do we learn? We learn from mistakes. And so we have to make mistakes. Success comes from experience. And experience comes from mistakes and learning from them. So there is something wrong with not learning from them. Have you heard the story of the man who had a joke played on him? His friend put his hand against the tree and said, Here, I want you to do something for me. I want you to wind up and punch my hand as hard as you can. And he said, Oh, this is great. And he says, Okay, one, two, three. And he wound up, and the man, of course, moved his hand, and he punched the tree and nearly crushed his knuckles. He said, Boy, that's funny. And so he says, I've got to pull that on my brother. And so he went to his brother and said, here, I want to show you something. I want to give you the opportunity to punch as hard as you can my hand, okay? At the count of three, I want you to punch my... Well, he didn't learn anything, did he? We don't want to be like that guy. We want to learn from our mistakes. We want to learn from the past after we have remembered and dealt with the past. We want to learn from it, and then we want to forget the past. Now we're ready. We're ready. This is what Paul says in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. You can't just leave the past behind if you haven't dealt with it. But once you've dealt with it, you can leave it behind and reach forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Friends, You can't press towards the goal if you're facing backwards. But do you want to break the power of the past in your life? Isaiah 43, 18 tells us, do not remember the former things. Remember them, but then deal with them, learn from them, and forget them. Do not consider the things of old. Why? Because after you've done all the important steps, then you can live today. Two days ago, I was shopping with my wife in her favorite store, TJ Maxx, and I passed by a sign that just caught my eye. It was Winnie the Pooh 
And he said, today is my new favorite day. And I thought, that's great. I picked it up. My wife was in line. I went to take to show her. I figured she'd want to buy it. And when I got there, she already had the same sign in her cart. She knew me. This is my favorite day. Any day that ends in Y is my favorite day. Why? Because this is the day the Lord has made. And I refuse to try and rejoice in yesterday. It's too late. It's gone. And I can't rejoice in tomorrow because I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow. But God has graciously given me this day, and it's my new favorite day. It's a day that ends in Y. And so I'm going to rejoice in this day. I'm not going to live in the past. This is the first day of the rest of my life. It's the first day of our church's next 250 years. We um, need to move forward as a church. We need to honor our past. We will do that today. We'll do that tonight. But we best honor our past and those who have heroically gone before us by living fully in the present. Not glorying in the past, not wallowing in the past, but living in the present with faith, looking to the future. We have to honor those who've gone before us by doing what they did. They lived in the present, even in 1773. We need to, like them, live, serve, and fight in the present time. We cannot be effective serving today in 2023 by singing, I believe, in yesterday. It's about today. The good old days are almost always the product of a bad old memory. Maybe the best thing about the good old days is they are gone forever. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you dwell on your past failures, you'll have many more. If you dwell on your past victories, you may not have any more. But if we as Stanford Baptist Church can move on from the past and pray to God that we will allow him to do a new thing in us, here's what we can do with our future. Four things to do with your past. Remember it, deal with it, learn from it, and forget it. But God wants to do a new thing. What can we do about the future? Verse 19, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? The Southern Baptist Convention last year, the National Convention in New Orleans, one of the speakers got up and said, if the 60s ever come back, my church is prepared for it. Because a lot of our churches are living not even in the 60s, but maybe the 50s or sometime long before that. God wants to do a new thing. He's not living in the 50s. He's not living in the 90s. He is in eternity, but he wants us to face today the day that he's given us. He wants to go forward. God is a creative God. God is an innovative God. And he wants to do something new. I don't know what it is exactly, but I've got a pretty good idea. I think it has something to do with seeking and to save what's lost. Are there some lost people around us? I do he want, I know he wants us to do something with the gospel, and I know he wants us to do it now. We can't do it yesterday. If we don't do it today, it will never get done. And so what does God want us to do? If we want to face the future, it's right there in verse 19. The first word I want you to focus on is I. Behold, I will do a new thing. We need to face the future humbly. It's not what Pastor Jeff's going to do. It's not what this board's going to do. It's not what you're going to do. It's not what we're going to do together. It's what God's going to do through us. God says, I will do a new thing. Forgive God for having a preference for doing a new thing. When we are young, very young, we are endlessly entertained with a game of peekaboo. And a baby can laugh a hundred times. Peekaboo, ha ha, do it again. My grandchildren want me to read them the same book. As soon as I'm finished, read it again. I want to go get another book. When we get mature, we want to read a new book. We want to sing a new song, play a new game. God who created us, God who's infinitely creative, look around at the world he created. He didn't make everything in black and white, shades of gray. He made things in different colors. He made, he could have made our food all taste the same, like the fuel we put in the car. 
but he made many different flavors and he made many different kinds of animals. There's not just cats, there's not just dogs, there's not just cats and dogs, and every one of them has so many different breeds, he makes so, and so many different kinds of people. God wants to do a new thing. So rather than ask him to bless our plans, which if we're honest, isn't that what much of our prayer life ends up being? God do this and God do that. And by the way, would you bless my plans? No, we need to not ask him to bless our plans. We need to say, God, what are your plans and what do you want to do? You want to do a new thing in my life, in our life. When it comes to the future, all of us are clueless. We don't know. So we must face the future humbly. Proverbs 27, 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Wouldn't you hate to be a weatherman, a weather person? You know, they're wrong quite a bit of the time, and it's right out there on public record. How about a stock ro- broker or a financial advisor? The so-called prophets who predict the end of the world. It doesn't make much sense to trust your life, your money, your health to someone who doesn't know the future. But how about trusting your life to someone who's already there? Someone who knows the future like the past because he's already there. God knows James 4.14 says, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Well, yeah, of course. But an old Christian song says, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future, and I know he holds my hand. We can trust God. He is already in tomorrow. We can face the future humbly because God said, I will do a new thing. In Jeremiah 10.23 He says, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Oh, we try. But Jesus taught us to pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We get it backwards. We think prayer is getting our will done in heaven. Twisting God's arm to see things my way and doing what I want. That's not prayer. That's a shopping list. Real prayer is, as Jesus described it, getting God's will done on earth. God, what do you want to do in me? What do you want me to do? Praying that his will would be done in our life. So what new thing does God want to do in our church? I know one thing. He wants us to be more like Jesus next week than we are now. I know another thing. He wants more people to know him next week than know him now. And he wants us to be involved in both of those things, discipleship and evangelism. The Great Commission has not changed for 2,000 years, and it's not changing anytime soon. Our job is to find out what his will is, to cooperate and say, Lord, do a new thing in me. Do a new thing in us. God, do something surprising, amazing. So let's face the future humbly. And second, I want you to look at the next word, I We'll do a new thing, a new thing. This would be facing the future expectantly. I don't know what it is, but I know it's a new thing. So I can't know what it is, so I ought to be expecting the unexpected. We want to be flexible, willing to experiment. We want to to change, but we don't want to change. We love variety, but we hate to change. We get comfortable in our comfortable place. We say variety is the spice of life. But most of us avoid it like the plague. We like familiarity and being comfortable, but you know what familiarity breeds. Contempt, right? Churches are guilty of this all the time. Every pastor has heard these words. Pastor, please fix our church. Just don't change anything. How are we supposed to do that? You see, the seven last words of the church... We've never done it that way before. We don't want to do a new thing, but God wants to do a new thing. Dare we tell God we've never done it that way before? Precisely, he says. How's that thing that you've been doing now working out for you? God says in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call to me and I will answer you and show you average, mediocre things. No. Call to me and, answer, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. He wants to show us things that we can't even begin to imagine. Great and mighty things. He wants to amaze us, surprise us. 1 Corinthians 2.9, 9, 
Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We say, God, we've never done it that way before. And he says, you're right, but I want to do something in you beyond your wildest dreams. We have very little imagination, and with small, finite minds, we look at what is, and we ask, why? That's our most important question. Why, God, why did this happen to me? God, with his great, big, infinite mind, creative mind, he looks at the things that are not. And he says, why not? Do you know what you are missing? We don't know. We can't know. But he does. This verse has become popular recently. Jeremiah 29, 11. I see it on posters and bumper stickers everywhere. I know the plans I have for you, God says. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. We love the verse. Do we believe it? We don't know what his plans are, but we know they're great beyond our imagination. Can we trust him? He says, be anxious for nothing. Philippians 4, 6. As a church, are we open to the new things that God wants to do? All we got to do is just open up our hearts and say, God, I trust you. You're not going to harm us. You're going to prosper us. You want to bless us. Lord, would you do a new thing in me? Would you do thing, a new thing in us? We don't have to beg him. Here's the good news. You don't have to pretty, pretty, pretty please him. He wants to bless us more than we want him to bless us. He wants to save souls in Stanford more than we want souls to be saved in Stanford. He wants to change us to be more like Jesus more than we want to be changed. So, as a person, what new thing does God want to do in your life? The tragedy is we often miss out on it, but the truth is God wants to do something special. And so let's do it expectantly. It's a new thing. We can't know. We shouldn't know. We don't know. But God knows, and he knows what he's doing. The third way we face the future, we face the future not only humbly and expectantly, but immediately. The next word is now. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. We're not talking about the future. We're talking about the present. Now it shall spring forth. You know, we can talk about the future. We can dream about the future. But if we do diddly squat about the future, there will be no future. We end up procrastinating away our days. But God says, now it shall spring forth. The future is tomorrow. The present is all we have. And we must face the future immediately. The only way we can face it right now, we can talk about what God wants over the next 50 years, the next five years, the next five months, the next five days. But if we want the future to change, then we have to change it starting right now. The only way to change the future is to change the present. Only way is to change today. That's why my favorite verse in the Bible, you'll hear me quote it every other week, probably. Psalm 118, verse 24, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoice, we choose. Do you focus on today? Live fully today, no matter what. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. What are you waiting for? If you don't do it now, you maybe, probably never will. By now, all of us have become familiar with the well-loved poetry, Footprints in the Sand. How many of you have ever heard or read the story of the Footprints in the Sand? Anybody never hear of Footprints in the Sand? Someone was seeing their life as footprints in the sand, two sets. But every time there was problems, there was only one set. And then we said, God, how come you left me? And God said, oh, that's when I carried you. And everyone goes, ah. I'd like to read to you a new version of Footprints in the Sand. And it's a little bit more realistic for us. One night I had a wondrous dream. One set of footprints there were seen. The footprints of my precious Lord, but mine were not along the shore. And then some stranger prints appeared, and I asked the Lord, what have we here? Those prints are large and round and neat, but Lord, they're too big for feet. My child, he said in somber tones, for miles I carried you alone. I challenged you to walk in faith, but you refused and made me wait. 
You disobeyed, you would not grow. The walk of faith, you would not grow. I had enough, I got fed up, and there I dropped you on your butt. Because in life there comes a time when one must fight and one must climb, when one must rise and take a stand or leave their butt prints in the sand. Unfortunately, both versions are true. Sometimes we just wait on the Lord and wait on the Lord and nothing ever happens. That's how he poignantly ends. Behold, shall you not know it? Sometimes we're just too comfortable. Sometimes we give up. Sometimes we dwell in the past. But the tragedy of life, my favorite saying, my favorite verse, Psalm 118, verse 24, my favorite saying, you'll hear it at least once a month, is the tragedy of life is not what happens to us, but what we miss. We think the tragedies are the bad things that happen to us that hurt us, but the greater tragedies are the ones that we miss, the opportunities that we miss. And here is what God says in the middle of verse 19, shall you not know it? Behold, now it shall spring forth, but shall you not know it? It's God's job, right? But we must, fourthly, face the future responsibly, humbly, expectantly, immediately, and responsibly. God wants to do something new, but he will not do it in spite of you. He wants you to choose to follow his way. We won't know it if we're not responsible. We can't know it if we don't do our part and take responsibility. We can't expect somebody else to do it. If we do, nobody will do it. Maybe you've heard this story. A story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. Four neighbors with strange names. Everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but you know who did it? That's right, the fourth neighbor. Nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody, and nobody did what anybody could have done. And in the end, who did the all-important job? Of course, you already know it. Nobody did it. And so what we need is a few brave Isaiahs. Remember what Isaiah did in Isaiah chapter 6? The Lord said, who will go for us? And Isaiah, he didn't pull a Moses and say, Lord, I don't speak good. No, no, I can't do it. Send Aaron. This is Moses' refusal summed up in a great book title. Here am I, Lord, send Aaron. No, Isaiah says, here am I, Lord, send me. This is the response that God waits for us. He wants us to volunteer. He loves it when we say, send me. And so I said to God, there's a city up there in Stanford that needs Jesus. Lord, send me. And I'm praying that you will join me in this adventure. God wants to do a new thing in Stanford, in Stanford Baptist Church and in Stanford, Connecticut. He wants to do something beyond our imagination. He wants to glorify Jesus, not us. And so I pray as your pastor that God will give us a God-sized purpose, a harvest-sized vision, and a church-sized workforce. That's what we need. We need to get our vision bigger. We need to have a purpose that's God-sized, a vision that's harvest-sized, but we need a workforce that is church-sized. So what is it that God wants to do in and through you and me? What is the new thing God wants to do? I have to be humble. I don't know, but I think I know something. I learned the lesson when I was reading, probably for the thousandth time, 2 Peter 3.9. I was reading this beautiful verse that I've preached on many times, quoted many times. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know what all means? All means all, and that's all all means. And I had read it, I had preached on it, I probably used it in a hundred sermons. But this particular day, God spoke to me, not in an audible voice like one of the television prophets, but it was unmistakably God. It wasn't me, I'd never heard someone else say it, I never read it anywhere. 
But as I read, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God said to me, Jeff, I'm not willing that any should perish. How many are you willing to let perish? I felt as if God was sitting on my chest. I couldn't breathe. To be honest with God, I had to say, Lord, by the way that I live, I'm willing to let a lot more people perish than you are. By the way that I don't share the gospel every chance I get, and I've never been able to get over it, I know that God is calling me and calling us to talk to more people about Jesus, to give them the opportunity to know Jesus. What if God wants to save more people in the next five years than he did in the last 50 through Stanford Baptist Church? Could we even begin to imagine what that would be like? Okay, here's the inside information. He does. I know he wants more people to be saved in the next five years than have been saved in the last 250 years. The question is not what he wants to do. The question is what will we allow him to do through us? Maybe the answer is found in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Paul says to Timothy, the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will also teach others. Here's what we need to do. We need not just to win souls. We need to win soul winners. We need to be soul winners, multipliers, who reach other multipliers. If we reach one person a year, each one of us, after the end of the year, 7,500 people are saved, praise the Lord. But if each one of us reproduces themselves with another reproducer, if we win two people who each win two people, we'll reach the whole world in 10 years. It is God's call upon us to each one of us find a Paul that will teach us and maybe two Timothys that we can teach. Is there someone that you look up to that can disciple you? Would you enlist a Paul in your life right now, today? Would you find two Timothys, maybe someone who knows Jesus and someone who doesn't, someone that you'll spend time with? This is what God has called us as a church to do, to win the lost. There are so many people in the shadow of our steeple who don't know Jesus. And he wants us to do our part. It's not the churches halfway around the world. It's got to be us to reach Stanford, Connecticut, and the other evangelical churches in the area. Is there something that we can do to band together and tell people, Jesus changed my life and he can change yours too? You may not be a theologian. You may not be a mature Christian. But can you say these words? Jesus changed my life and he can change yours too. That's what a witness is. You can do that. I don't know the answer to that question, but come to church and I'll find someone who can. Down south, this is what I said. Where do you go to church? Up here, when I pastor in the north, I say, do you go to church? Do you have a church home? That's the easiest thing in the world to say. You have a church home in town? No. Well, I know a great church right there on High Ridge Road. Stanford Baptist Church. They love Jesus. They love people. And they're Jesus changed my life and he can change yours. That's what a witness is. That's what a witness does. Is there something in your past that you need to deal with? Remember it, deal with it, learn from it, forget it. But are you ready personally to face the future? Humbly, expectantly, immediately, responsibly? God wants you to allow him to do a new thing in your life. But here's his convicting question to all of us. Now. I will do a new thing. Behold, will you not know it? What a tragedy if God is not able to do in and through us what he wants to do, what he's perfectly willing to do. Let us pray. God, thank you for what you want to do through each one of us, what you want to do in each one of us, what you want to do in and through us collectively as a church. And Lord God, I pray I don't beg you to do what you don't want to do. I pray that your will would be done in us as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray that we would surrender our wills so that you can do in us what you've been waiting to do. We don't plead with you. We don't twist your arm. Lord, we just ask you, Lord, do what you want to do in us. We trust you. We know you want to do great and mighty things, good things, not to harm us, but to bless us. 
Lord, I pray that you would bless us with the Holy Spirit and his anointing on our ministry. Lord, I pray that you would bless us with new life, people coming to know Jesus, the baptism waters stirring week after week with people who not only come to know Jesus, but bring their friends. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be a part of something bigger than ourselves, something that will outlast us and 250 years, something that will make a difference in eternity. With your head still bowed and your eyes closed, if you are here today and you've never trusted in Christ as your Savior, you've never dealt once for all with sin, you do know, of course, don't you, that we can't save ourselves. That's why Jesus died. He died on the cross because we couldn't save ourselves. And the gift of God is free. It can't be worked for or earned in part or in whole. But if you receive it this morning as a gift, God will come into your life and forgive your sins. We are saved by God's grace through our faith. Would you right now, in faith, say to the Lord something like this in your heart to him and mean it. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. But I believe you died for me. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. All of them. And make me a new person, the one you want me to be. With your head still bowed, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I'd love to pray with you, pray for you. Would you allow me that privilege? There's a little, on the little box there, you can check off the first box. Today, for the first time, I'm trusting Jesus, my Lord, and say, if you put that in the offering plate, your name, and how I can contact you, I'd love to pray with you. If you didn't pray that prayer and you want to, would you put your name on there or shake my hand at the door and say, Pastor, I'd, I'd love to know before I leave today that my sins are forgiven, that I'm in God's family. <clears throat> if you're a Christian and God is speaking today and there's something that you'd like to me to pray with you about, same goes for you. Put your name on that little card, put it in the offering plate, and it will get to my desk, and I will pray for you by name. I'll give you a call. You leave me your email, your phone number. I'll text you whatever you want. Lord, I pray that in us you do a new thing. We don't know what it is, but we wait expectantly, trusting you, Lord, we're excited for what you want to do in and through us. From Christ's name we pray. Amen. Stand together and sing a song, Ron.